today we are in Mark's Gospel, chapter 12, and I will read you verses 13 through 17. And they send unto him certain of the Pharisees and of the Herodians to catch him in his words. And when they were come, they say unto him, Master, we know that thou art true, and carest for no man, for thou regardest not the person of men, but teachest the way of God in truth. Is it lawful to give tribute to Caesar or not? Shall we give or shall we not give? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said unto them, Why tempt ye me? Bring me a penny that I may see it. And they brought it. And he saith unto them, Whose is this image and superscription? And they said unto him, Caesar's. And Jesus answering said unto them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. Once again, as Jesus was teaching in the temple in those last days before they finally got him, there he was just courageously in the midst of the crowd and there with all the authorities and the temple guards and all the religious authorities trying to catch him. They're preaching anyway, telling the people that the kingdom of God was at hand and that their salvation was at hand, teaching them how to live. I would love to have heard Jesus preaching, wouldn't you? Can you imagine? Not everyone was happy with it. Those religious authorities, the ruling class Jews, the establishment in Jerusalem were not happy at all with Jesus of Nazareth. The scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and that's who we're talking about when we say the Herodians. This was sort of the royal party. These were the chief priests and their families who passed the chief priesthood back and forth between them and bought it like it was a commodity. The Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, if they were to save their ruling establishment from destruction, they felt they had to confront the Son of God right there in the temple where he was preaching every day before they finally did murder him. As Mark reports, they thought that they might humiliate and discredit Jesus by catching him in his words. This was not an honest disagreement or a debate about what was true or right. They weren't searching for facts. And, you know, we've seen this kind of thing in our own day and time. If you ever watch cable news, you know what I'm talking about here. They were playing the game that modern activist journalists play when they interview a person they oppose. It's a game called Gotcha. I got you. The idea is to keep asking hypothetical questions or trick questions or to demand responses to fake news until the victim makes some mistake in their answer that they can capitalize on. And then the mistake, innocent or not, is used for the character assassination of their prey. If you are pro-life, then clearly you are in favor of women dying from abortions with rusty coat hangers in dirty back alleys, aren't you? Tell us, why do you hate women so much? What made you join the war on women? Tell us, yes or no, are you still beating your wife? That's the kind of <laughs> questioning you can get. Gotcha! If you can't beat them fairly, then discredit them, neutralize them, trip them up, render them a laughing stock, or at least marginalize them in the eyes of the public. Lincoln said that you can fool all the people some of the time and some of the people all the time, but you cannot fool all the people all the time. And I think that's pretty much true. You know, we can even fool ourselves, especially if we're not walking with God. But for all the clever deception in the world or from the pits of hell itself, 
You cannot fool Jesus at any time. The religious authorities of that day, the ruling class establishment of our own time, share something. They share a certain disdain and even a seething hatred for Jesus and for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The gods they serve are money and power and celebrity, and they will have no other gods before them. No lie is too big, no crime is too great, no gossip too petty, no treason too low for those people. For them, the ends they seek justify the means they use. There are plenty of willfully ignorant people, blind folk as we all once were, who follow their blind leaders, unable to imagine or understand the world that we see in the light of God that is Jesus Christ our Lord. These people are not any more evil than we were and are no less in need of salvation than ourselves. And I am not being political here in any kind of partisan sense. What I say applies across the board here. On social media in the last year, it was a contentious year, I I had to block people who supported Hillary Clinton. And I had to block people who supported Ted Cruz. I had to block people who supported Bernie Sanders. I had to block people who supported Donald Trump. These were people who had something in common. I don't think they knew the Lord, or if they ever did, they weren't walking with him. Their partisan politics was their God. It was the most important thing to them. Not personal relationships, not courtesy, not friendship, not truth. Winning was all that mattered. They were bitter, angry, unyielding, unforgiving people. They were trolling people, if you know what that means. They were trolling people they had previously befriended, causing havoc and distress, wasting time and wasting their lives. And you know something? Neither you nor I are under any obligation to waste the life that God has given us. Most of all, the time that we spend contending against contentious people is time that has not been redeemed for the kingdom of God. you got to pick your battles, and sometimes it's just wasting your life. These people, and it didn't matter what side of the political spectrum they were on, they weren't worshiping the Lord God in spirit and in truth because they worshiped the false idols of money and power and celebrity. The best of them engage in a sort of hero worship of people who do good and even great deeds, but who are people nonetheless. Others in their number are simply worshiping success, those who worship money and power and celebrity or anything that they make their idol can be found in the partisans of every political group today. And so it was in the last days of Jesus while he preached in the temple in Jerusalem. You see, you could not find two groups of Jews who hated each other more than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The modern American equivalent would uh, respectively be Republicans and Democrats. You cannot find two mainstream political groups today that are more opposed to one another than them. And in Jesus' day, you couldn't find two groups who were more opposed to one another than the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And yet, these polar opposites were united on one front, keeping power in their own hands. The leading Pharisees would rather deal with the hated Sadducees than with Jesus. Even though they claimed to uphold the old-time religion, the, the entrenched Sadducees knew how to deal with their old enemies, the Pharisees, and they preferred to keep it that way. Likewise, today, we find the two sides of the modern establishment work together to destroy anyone or anything that disturbs the status quo. And in our daily lives, on an individual level, the people who hate God, the people who are running from him, will also hate anyone who disturbs their personal status quo. They will seek to silence or even to destroy them. The fear 
of the darker side of those who wield power is real. WikiLeaks, you've heard of WikiLeaks, right? They are a uh, loose organization of mostly anonymous computer hackers who are famous lately for leaking all kinds of terrible, damaging political emails. The other day, given all of the mysterious fatalities of various individuals close to power in the past few years, they issued a statement, and it read, No present WikiLeaks staff, including our editor, have medical, psychological, or drug conditions which could lead to sudden death. <laughs> These people are genuinely in fear for their lives. Their leader is holed up in an embassy in England and can't leave without being arrested. They played a critical role in upsetting the balance of power, and that is being played out from America to Great Britain to France to Spain, throughout Europe, and throughout all the Western world. The people of the West have grown weary of their misrule, but the ruling class never takes such things lying down, whether in the first century or the 21st century. Many people in the establishment, the ruling class of any age, are given over to powers and principalities of darkness, as so many people are in every other walk of life. If you are a threat to their money or a threat to their power, you may be facing ruination or even the termination of your life. And so on this particular day in the temple, since they couldn't simply snatch Jesus from the midst of the adoring crowd, they came to play the game of gotcha with the Son of God. Can I share a truth with you? Jesus doesn't play games. If you seek to play games with God, you will soon learn what the religious authority should have already known. Should we pay our taxes? It's a tribute to Caesar, you know, and we as Jews should pay no tribute to anyone but God. What do you say to that, Jesus? They thought they had him in a fix. It was pretty clever if Jesus said, don't pay tribute to the idolatrous Romans. You should worship only God. Well, then he would have become a public enemy of Rome, and they would crucify him. If Jesus simply said, submit to the pagans and pay the tribute to Caesar, then the crowd, which hated Rome, would have turned on him. And then the authorities could haul him away and do their worst. Instead, Jesus called for them to produce a coin. And of course, the coin had the face of Caesar on it. And he made them describe it. And I imagine that there may have been an angry murmur through the crowd and then a hush as Jesus spoke. The Son of God famously said then, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. And everyone marveled. They were astonished at what he said. Jesus didn't fall into their gotcha trap. You know, there was no mind more brilliant, no soul more wise, no spirit more true than that of the carpenter of Nazareth. With that one profound sentence, Jesus not only answered their question, he showed all the assembled multitude the shallowness of that kind of thinking. And he left us with a principle of citizenship that Christianity has sought to follow and understand for 2,000 years. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. It is a principle that we follow in our own separation of church and state that keeps the government from having an official religion in America, as some of the original colonies did, as England did. And it keeps any one denomination from using the state to have power over another. The things that are God's are not the business of Caesar, even when he tries to make it his business. Jesus asked for a certain Roman coin. The King James translates it as a penny. The word was denarius. He asked for a denarius specifically. It is a small silver coin that was the pay for a day of unskilled labor. 
And by the way, Jesus didn't have a single denarius of his own. And by asking his questioners to produce one, Jesus also showed the crowd that these hypocrites did not mind carrying the hated Roman coins themselves on the holy grounds of the temple. And that's why I imagine that the crowd may have had a sudden stir of indignation at them before Jesus even answered. Rome required one-tenth of the produce of the land. They imposed a 1% income tax. Doesn't that sound horrible? And a poll tax that was required every, uh, of every adult every year annually uh, if they were under the age of 65. When we look at our taxation rates today, we can kind of wonder, well, what were the Jews so upset about? They got peace, they got aqueducts, they, they, they got commerce, they got rich, but it wasn't so much the rate of taxation as the very fact of it. Especially hated was that poll tax that everyone had to pay every year, and that tax was one denarius, the very coin that Jesus requested. The coin had the name and the face of the Roman emperor stamped on it, and it read, Tiberius Caesar, the divine Augustus, son of Augustus, Pontifex Maximus, the high priest of the Roman nation. It was a graven image of one who was worshipped as a god by law through the Roman Empire and a sub subject and an object of idolatry. A Sadducee, most likely, in my opinion, was the one who gave it to Jesus, probably not even realizing that he was admitting and showing off his own technical idolatry. Jesus had already turned the tables on them, you see, before he even answered their trick question with a statement that is now known even to those who do not call him Lord. Render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Sometimes people have taken that to mean that a Christian should have nothing whatsoever to do with government. And I've never trusted that interpretation. There's so many instances in the Bible from cover to cover of leaders who followed God, of prophets who urged leaders to follow God, of what has happened when leaders do not follow God. It is a certain principle that governments are instituted among men and given their authority by God. God allows there to be government because we need to be governed, quite frankly. Jesus did not abandon, however, the responsibility and the authority of government to pagans and atheists when he made this statement. Remember, the interpretation of any scripture in the word of God has to be made in the context of the entire Bible. Any interpretation that sets the meaning of a scripture against the rest of the Bible is not inspired by the Holy Spirit. Instead, we believe that the Christian, in rendering unto Caesar the things that are Caesar, is supposed to be a law-abiding, responsible, and even patriotic citizen. And you don't cheat on your taxes, do you? Not one of you. You shouldn't. Individuals who serve in government may be very wicked indeed, but government itself isn't wicked by definition, when it is possible we should seek to encourage and to establish government that is not only rightful but also righteous. In the course of the last 2,000 years, more than any other force or movement in history, it is Christianity that has brought about the best and the most righteous laws and leadership that mankind has ever known. People have said, well, how can you trust the Bible as a moral authority. Don't you know the Bible condones slavery? It gave rules for slavery in the Old Testament and a slave was told to go back to his master in the New Testament. Slavery was the most immoral thing man ever did to man. If the Bible condones it, then the Bible can't be moral. If they are seeking an honest answer, if they really want to know, then I'll tell them. But usually, People asking that kind of a question are not honestly seeking an answer. They're trying to play gotcha, and I let them go their way in willful ignorance. The Bible did not condone slavery. It recognized it. 
It explained how to act rightly within such circumstances. I remember an old Ku Klux Klansman many years ago telling me that slavery was justified in the Bible, and he cited the very same scriptures that the militant atheist will today. And I asked him, would you like to be a slave? Of course not. Then do unto others as you would have them do unto you. No one wants to be a slave. We shouldn't want anyone else to be a slave. But if slavery exists as an institution in a nation, then until you can get your government to change it or change your government, you have to obey. That is why Paul told the servant to go back to his master. He wasn't saying slavery is right. He was more concerned that the Christian example of the slave might win that master to Jesus. The eternal life of our souls is more important than the temporary afflictions of this earth. Even something as bad and terrible as slavery is nothing compared to hell. And may I say that slavery was in fact ended in the Christian world. They're still practicing it in Islam. But in the Christian world, slavery was ended by Christians who knew it was wrong. And they were granted the power of government to fix it. It is a great tragedy in America that slavery did not end until in the throes of a bloody war between the states and the opinions of Christian Europe forced the hands of uh, President Lincoln throughout the west the rest of the quish, quish, I'm having trouble here throughout the west of the Christian west <laughs> throughout the rest of the Christian west you try that <laughs> slavery was ended peacefully throughout the rest of Christianity because the Christian people managed to do it lawfully they didn't need civil wars to end slavery elsewhere it's an extreme example of Caesar's power being abused to right a wrong and of that same power being used rightly to end an evil institution. John Brown, you know who he was. John Brown fought slavery with murderous rampages and he helped precipitate a war that still scars our nation. By the way, snowbirds, we forgive you. William Wilberforce over in England fought slavery through persuasion, and prayer and brought it down in the British Empire and all around the world without the racial animosities that still fester in our land. Two great governments of nations overwhelmingly populated with Christians and two very different outcomes. But you see, after so many centuries of Christianity, the West eventually not only removed the shackles of the slaves, but also the penalties of indentured servitude, the harshness of debtors' prisons, the hopeless grind of serfdom, and even the hereditary rule of kings and emperors. Some people say that the Christian West went too far when we gave women the vote, but I'm not going there. <laughs> I've got to go home tonight. <laughs> There was no longer a Caesar or some other divine monarch or king in charge of the government by the time Christianity got through. Now the people themselves of the Christian West could govern themselves. A Christian people does not need a king or an emperor, but has the spiritual gift of self-control to such a degree that they can govern themselves. But we are still disastrously close to throwing that away. Perhaps we need no Caesar over us, but we still have to have a government. If we were perfectly righteous people, we wouldn't need any government at all. But we do. And we, the people, have become Caesar here in America. We choose the people who serve us in government. We limit their power to govern as we see fit. But the responsibility and authority of Caesar has been granted unto us. So since God has made us Caesar, how do we render unto Caesar what is Caesar's? Well, we continue to obey the laws of the land. We continue to work peacefully, to change the laws if they are not righteous. You know how you can tell if a law is righteous or not? Use that same golden rule that I used on that Ku Klux Klansman. If you don't want a law to apply to you, don't make it apply to everyone else. Congress could learn that lesson. A Christian must not behave wrongfully 
to right a wrong. We must instead remember we have a duty to, rem to render unto God the things that are God's. There are extraordinary circumstances where a Christian might run afoul of Caesar. Refusing to worship money or power or celebrity can be harmful to your Hollywood career. It might make elective office or promotion at work impossible in some places. We owe God our worship to the exclusion of the worship of anything else. And over the last 2,000 years, worshiping God in spirit and in truth has cost Christians their homes, their loved ones, their livelihoods, their health, their limbs, and their lives. But the reward for rendering unto God the things that are God's far outweighs the damnation of rendering unto Caesar the things that are God's. And as Jesus has shown us by his life, the Christian does not render unto God the things that are Caesar's. Jesus does not need armies as Caesar does. Jesus commands the hosts of heaven. Jesus does not need taxation as Caesar does. Jesus owns the cattle on a thousand hills. Jesus does not impose a bewildering array of laws and regulation as Caesar does. Jesus came to make us free indeed. Jesus only requires the things that are God's. He wants our love. If Jesus has our love, then he has our obedience. Jesus wants us to enjoy our freedom and to live in him, directed by his Holy Spirit, letting him live in us. And when we do, then we are filled with love for one another. And when we are all filled with love for one another, living a life filled with the Holy Spirit, living in Jesus and Jesus in us, then we don't need Caesar at all. The day is approaching when Jesus will return to take up the throne of his kingdom. And in that day, there will be no Caesar. In that day, we will live in perfect freedom from all the taxation, and regulation and requirements of human government. Jesus will take back all authority unto himself. And the days when we will have no need of Caesar are going to be glorious days indeed. <laughs>